Hello, my name is Harold Halfdan and welcome to Archaeological Minecraft. I'm a former archaeologist who enjoys playing Minecraft and thought it would be fun to combine the two. In today's episode, we'll be talking about the Roman city of Pompeii. Now, I suspect that every one of you has heard of Pompeii, the city in central Italy near the modern city of Naples that was famously in AD 79 buried under the volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius, the Roman city that was completely destroyed and which has left ghostly impressions in the volcanic soil of the people who died in the disaster. Pompeii is a treasure trove to archaeologists as it's a city with the buildings, artifacts, people, and even pets of those people and other animals frozen in time going about their daily lives when disaster struck and everything was cocooned in meters of volcanic ash and protected from the ravages of time. I'm going to be honest and admit that to replicate all of the city of Pompeii is way too big a project and a much larger scope of work that I am willing to bite off. However, I wanted to instead focus on some really cool locations in Pompeii that I think are fascinating and that if you are building your own Minecraft world applicable to take inspiration from. So in today's episode, we're going to construct a single block of the city and focus on some of the shops that everyday Pompeians would have used and visited in their daily life. In case you're curious or want to look up this city block on your own, it's Riggio 9, Insula 3, right on the Via Stabiana in the center part of the city. A quick explanation of what I just said there. Archaeologists have divided the city into different sections or regions called Riggio, and then given each block of that district a block number. The block is called an insula. Each shop or other entrance on the block gets a number. In that way, if you want to locate a specific building, you could say Riggio 9, Insula 3, Entrance 6, or Riggio 9.3.6, which, if you're curious, was a doctor's office. In our modern day, we tend to think of shops and stores being single-use buildings instead of buildings that have multiple purposes. What's interesting about many of the shops of Pompeii is that it can sometimes be a challenge to determine if a shop was actually a shop or if a building's purpose was a small residence. You see, it isn't as if many of the shops had massive amounts of inventory, and many of them appear to contain small quantities of larger variety of different items for sale. Also, many of the smaller shops seem to have only been staffed by just a couple of individuals, contained hearths for cooking, and contained sleeping areas. So given that, you can see that depending on the type of shop, with its shop owners living or cooking in the shop, how the line between a domestic structure and a shop might get blurred. Also, it was common for many locations to contain a small bar to serve food. Instead of sit-down restaurants like many food establishments are today, Think of these more like a permanent food truck, where there might be a tile or marble covered counter that some could quickly order and pick up food and then be on their way. These counters often had lids that would cover depressions where ceramic jars or bowls were set into the counter. Think of this like Roman era fast food. So imagine this, you're running or owning your own shop. It might be a place where you live and you cook and prepare food for your family. You might sell a service, perhaps you're a carpenter or stonemason, or sell household goods. And then at the front of your shop, you have a counter where passers-by can order some food or drink that you've pre-prepared. Maybe you have a large pot of porridge or soup that you leave warm over a fire all day. Passerbys are then able to walk into your shop, buy goods, and or catch a bite to eat. Certainly, if your shop was on a main road or one leading to the amphitheater, you could collect some extra coin and help drive traffic into your shop this way. What I described might not seem novel, and in fact might seem pretty ordinary, as these are activities that we do all the time. But this wasn't a typical scenario at that time in history. In most places and cultures, shopping was limited to market areas where vendors would have stalls where they would sell their goods or food. Pompeii is one of the first archaeological locations where we start seeing the transitions to shops, as I described above. Many of these shops even had shuttered doors that could be slid up or swung open in the morning and closed at night when the shop closed, just like what happens with shops today. Speaking of the fast food eaten by the Romans at Pompeii, much of the Roman diet consisted of bread. That bread came from imported wheat that was predominantly grown in Egypt, the province of Africa, and Sicily, and brought into Pompeii, and many other cities of the Roman Empire through 
the port at Pompeii. The port was home to the Roman Empire's Mediterranean naval fleet and was a large commercial hub as well. The land around Pompeii was known for being extraordinarily fertile on account of the repeated volcanic eruptions from Mount Vesuvius, and wheat and other grains were grown in the fields of Pompeii. What was more important was growing vegetables. Back then, they didn't have refrigeration for good ways to preserve vegetables for long-distance transit, and so those types of more perishable products were grown locally and then distributed to cities in the surrounding areas of the Italian peninsula. Now, when I speak of vegetables, don't imagine modern Italian cooking or modern Italian food. Things like tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, and other staple foods of modern Italian cooking came from the New World and were unknown in ancient Rome. Rather, think of vegetables like leeks, cucumbers, onions, beans, peas, lentils, cabbages, and carrots. But even then, the vegetables that we might buy today at your local grocery store are not the same as existed back in Roman times. Take carrots, for example. We're used to seeing carrots with their distinctive orange color, and that's how they are in Minecraft. But back then, they weren't orange, but many different colors like white, purple, red, which can only now be seen if you look for heirloom varieties. They also ate honey, which was an important sweetener as they didn't have sugar as we do today, different cheeses, eggs, meat, pork being the most popular meat, fish, figs, hazelnuts, and walnuts. The Romans also loved a condiment called garum, which was made from putting small oily fish like sardines or anchovies in a barrel. They would layer them with fish, then salt, then fish, then salt, and then leaving them to ferment in the sun for sometimes months. The barrel would then be opened and the clear top liquid would be ladled out and put into jars and sold. It wasn't too dissimilar to modern day fish sauce or soy sauce. The Romans ate it up, literally. And some of the best garum that was exported all across the empire came from Pompeii. Some people would even make small batches in their own homes. There were also olive and grapes where they would be important not just for food, but for olive oil and the grapes for making wine. A local winery excavated outside of Pompeii was found with large storage jars sunk into the ground where they would store the wine to sell or to export and which could store 8,900 liters or 2,600 gallons of wine. That said, based on the writings of Pliny the Elder, a Roman author and philosopher who wrote about the city of Rome and who died when Mount Vesuvius erupted, said that the wine from Pompeii would give you a massive headache the day after drinking it. Not all wine was considered bad, however, and sometimes it would be served watered down or with honey or spices added to it. Incidentally, it was Pliny's nephew, Pliny the Younger, who wrote down the accounts of the disaster and destruction of the city. This shop we're building here is a dye shop. There were seven known dye shops in Pompeii, six of which have been excavated. There were different types of dye shops, and some seemed to focus on different kinds of dyeing techniques. Some focused on the production of vat dyes and fermented dyes. Those are most common for making blue or indigo dyes, as indigo needs to be fermented to produce its distinctive blue color. In one such case, the workshop had two rooms, a courtyard with lead basins and four furnaces, with a large vat where the cloth would be placed into the vat of dye to soak up and absorb the color. In the other room are two rectangular vats along one wall and three more vats along the opposite wall. That indicates numerous different dyes and thus different colors could be produced. What is also an interesting detail is that the three vats on the one side of the room were designed so that the three vats could be connected to allow the liquid from each of the three vats to flow into the other vats along the wall. Perhaps that meant that colors could be combined or maybe that helped in the cleaning out of the vats between dyeing sessions. Another type of dyeing is called a mordant dye. In that dyeing technique, a substance is used to bind the dye into the fabric. That substance is called a mordant, thus the name. It comes from the Latin and means to bite, i.e. the substance allows the dye to bite and hold into the fabric, and while it's not much used today, was quite common back in the Roman era and is particularly good at dyeing wool, 
which was a very common, if not the most common, fabric used for clothing in ancient Rome. Unlike the Pompeian wine, which was of a quality that would give you a headache, in contrast, the wool used at Pompeii was reputedly of very high quality. As such, most of the dye shops in Pompeii produced mordant dyes, and that was what was produced in the dye shop that we're recreating here on this block. Romans also differentiated between two different kinds of dye based on their permanence. Infectoria were dyes that held their color and were permanent, and shops that specialized in those dyes, or those types of dyes, seemed to be more well laid out and organized, whereas the other type of dye, called Ophectoria, were dyes that seemed to be more temporary. The dye shop we're recreating on this block was an Ophectoria type that sold dyes that were more temporary. In those cases, the fabric could be stripped away of its dye and re-dyed, and the locations that specialize in that type of dyeing seem to be smaller and have less organized vats. Sometimes it seems that shops would pair up. For example, archaeologists have found in at least one instance that next to a shop that created dyes was another shop that sold the dyed fabric, and that was the instance in our shops here on this block. Roads at Pompeii were laid out in a rough grid shape. Each side of the street had a sidewalk, and as I pointed out in my Roman Roads and Road Station video, had speed bumps or speed humps in the middle of the road to help maintain street limits for carts. Incidentally, if you want to know more about the different kinds of Roman roads, how they were constructed, and watch me recreate them, and a Roman road station in Minecraft, please check out that video. In any case, back to this video. Cart traffic was restricted to after hours only, and putting in speed bumps in place helped keep that traffic quieter. I also suspect that having the raised speed bumps in the center of the road allowed for easier pedestrian traffic crossing the street when it was raining or when the roads were wet or flooded. Now, don't get the idea that the streets were filthy, dirty mess. I think people often have a vision or a perception of historical or ancient cities where people would just throw their trash or waste into the muddy or dirty streets, but that wasn't the case with Pompeii or Roman cities. Instead, waste was saved, and in particular, urine was saved and actually taxed and used for cleaning clothing and helped bleach and clean wool before it was dyed. Shops and residents alike were allowed and often did have a container set out on the street to collect passerby's urine if they had to, um, well, you know, do their business. Likewise, people's solid waste was also collected, sold, and used in the leather industry. Now, I hear a lot of you scrunching up your noses, but the Romans were near obsessed about cleanliness and spent hours at the baths, and the fabrics and clothes were thoroughly cleaned, so they didn't possess any odor or, well, yuckiness. As we move down the street from the dyer's workshop and the shop next to it seems to have been a paint shop followed by a household goods shop. As you can see, I did include some wool and carpet in these shops as they had partnered up with the dyer shop to sell some of the dyed fabric like I talked about before. In this next space, you can see I left open. While in this episode I focused on the shops on the block, the center of the block was populated with residences. I plan to focus on them in a future standalone episode. For now, just know that this is the entrance of the Casa di Marco Lucrenzo. As we continue down the street, we arrive at the doctor's office at Insula 936 I mentioned earlier in the episode, followed by a shop for a stonemason named Polocolus. We know his name as some of the shops have inscriptions still in place that say who lived in or owned the establishment. Think about that for a moment. Here thousands of years later, after the disaster of Pompeii, we know the names of the individuals who owned the shops and perhaps died in those shops. Next to the stonemason is a small shop whose purpose is currently of unknown purpose. I mocked this one up as if it was used as a small storage building. Continuing down the block, there's a carpenter shop owned by an individual named Titus, and then we reach the corner and a larger storefront. This shop is a bakery that also contained a bar where people could get food like I described previously. The citizens of Pompeii, much like the people of today, didn't often bake their own bread at home, but rather bought bread from shops 
that would bake loaves in large ovens designed to meet the demand of the hungry population. This often included all phases of the bread producing process. Some bakeries would grind their own grain, typically wheat, which were powered by donkeys or other animals. There are also examples of rooms and bakeries that were dedicated to kneading the flour into dough and forming it into loaves prior to it being baked in the oven. I wish I could better show in Minecraft what the support pillars, walls, and even oven were decorated like in this bakery because they had a cool layered design which were fairly thin strips of brick and stone. Some of the walls were also plastered over and decorated with colorful painted frescoes of interweaving snakes, wheat stalks, and people baking bread in ovens. I did what I could with brick and stone bricks interweaving those in the design and covering the walls with some Minecraft paintings, but it really isn't the same. I would highly suggest that you go look up this building and look at the frescoes. Continuing around the block next to the bakery was another bar that also contained a small dwelling of an individual named Fabius Kellerer, followed by another shop selling household goods, which was the dwelling of Catius Scythus. As you can see, there is another opening without a shop in the center of the side of the block, and that leads to another private dwelling contained in the center of the block, which I'll focus on in that later episode. Next to that entrance is the workshop and offices of Tetius Faustius. Continuing down the street, we come to a metalworking shop owned by Salustius Inventus, followed by yet another shop selling household goods and perhaps a dwelling that was also a bar owned by Paucius Clarus. As you come to the end of the block and the end of our little tour, you can see that like on the other side of the block, this site also contained a bakery that contained a bar that people could both buy bread, freshly baked in ovens, and also stop by a counter and grab a bite to eat. This location was also decorated with colorful frescoes on the wall. If we look around the corner, you can see it has a second side entrance and a small bench for people to sit and rest near the bakery entrance. As I'm sure you have no doubt noticed, I didn't put any roofs or ceilings on any of these shops. I did this because, as I said earlier, I intend to follow up this video on the shops of Pompeii with a second video focusing on the interior residences within the city block and plan to complete the block, including the roofs, at that time in that video. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode where we recreated a city block from the city of Pompeii and focused on a couple of different types of shops that you can recreate and take inspiration from in your own Minecraft world. I included some links to some of the articles I found while researching this topic, and you can check them out for yourself if you want to learn more. If you do, I highly recommend you check out the interactive maps that let you zoom in and out, just like Google Maps, and check individual buildings and see their functions and look at pictures. If you liked this video, please take the time and give it a like and make sure to subscribe so you get notified when I post videos. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye for now.